Hi everyone, this is lecture 18, blood. So we're gonna talk about blood today. Um, we have just finished two very intense cardiovascular lectures where we talked about all of the factors influence, influencing the cardiac cycle um, and then all of the factors influencing blood pressure. So today's lecture is a little bit shorter to give you a break um, from those last two lectures. So today we're gonna talk about the composition of blood we're going to talk about blood cell production and very briefly touch on blood clotting. So we are at the end now of our cardiovascular system lectures. We have talked about the heart as a double-sided pump to establish blood pressure and get blood flow out to the tissues. And we've done many measurements to look at whether adequate blood flow is getting to the tissues. We also talked about blood vessels as the passageways for blood to be distributed throughout the body and ultimately to get mater materials exchanged from the blood to and from the tissues. Lastly, we need to put it all together to think about what is actually in the blood um, and what is um, regulated within the blood. So the function of blood is transport. Blood transports oxygen and nutrients to our cells so that we can use those for cellular metabolism. When the cells go through metabolism, they then produce metabolic waste, namely carbon dioxide, that needs to be removed from the cells. The blood also transports hormones, and hormones overall are affecting homeostasis of the whole body on a slow time scale. Blood also functions in regulation. It maintains body temperature by absorbing and distributing heat, and it functions in protection. It prevents infection and prevents blood loss. So let's look at the components of blood. So if we take a blood sample here and we centrifuge it, so we spin it around and all of the heavy stuff moves to the bottom and the lighter stuff moves to the top, we're able to separate different components of the blood. The liquid portion of the blood that floats to the top is the plasma. That's about 55% of the whole blood. Then we have a small buffy coat which is containing white blood cells and platelets and then the rest of the blood will be red blood cells. So red blood cells are about 45% of the whole blood. The white blood cells, platelets, and red blood cells make up the formed elements of the blood. So first, plasma. So plasma is 52 to 50% 50 of the total blood volume. It is the liquid portion of blood. It's 90% water, 6 to 8% protein, and about 1% electrolytes, sodium, potassium, chloride, etc. Many nutrients, glucose, amino acids, waste, and dissolved gases. Because the plasma is 90% water, it acts as a pH buffer. So water itself is a good buffer, um, and plasma is the same. So plasma can resist changes in pH overall and contribute to homeostasis to maintain the pH of the blood neutral. Plasma proteins also have very important functions in the blood. In the previous lecture, we talked about maintaining osmotic balance during bulk flow. Um, we also um, can use the plasma proteins to carry certain molecules. Molecules that wouldn't normally be dissolved in the water portion of the plasma will be attached to the plasma proteins. So these are any lipid soluble molecules. So hormones, certain lipid soluble drugs, bile salts, cholesterol, those will all be attached to plasma proteins and traveling with the plasma proteins. These are primarily albumin protein, which is produced in the liver, but also globulin proteins. Globulin proteins are involved in blood clotting. They also form antibodies as part of our immune system, and they can be precursors to other hormones. Red blood cells are about 42 to 45 percent of the total blood volume. The measurement of the percent red blood cells in the total volume is hematocrit. Does anybody remember from the previous lecture what hematocrit or the percentage of blood cells in the blood affects in terms of blood pressure? 
Super bonus question if you get this one. So if you incre increase red blood cells, you're going to increase the viscosity of the blood and thereby increase the resistance of the blood. So the total percentage of red blood cells can actually affect the resistance of the blood flowing through the tissues. Okay, so red blood cells have a very particular structure. They have they are flattened cells that are narrowed at the center. So it's sort of like if you picture a donut, but you fill in the hole of the donut. So they have this biconcave shape and a flexible membrane that allows them to squeeze through small spaces. So they have this biconcave shape and a flexible membrane that allows them to squeeze through small spaces. They are absolutely packed with hemoglobin for oxygen transport. Because they're so packed with hemoglobin, red blood cells have no nucleus and no organelles. This maximizes the amount of oxygen they can transport, but it shortens their lifespan. If you have no nucleus and no organelles, you cannot replace components of your cells. And so their lifespan of red blood cells is only about 120 days. This means that red blood cells have to be continuously synthesized and they are made in the bone marrow. There are about two to three million cells per second made in the bone marrow. The broken down dead cells will be sent to the spleen for recycling. So the process of forming new red blood cells is called erythropoiesis. And this can, is happening in the red bone marrow. So in adults, the red bone marrow is prim, primarily in the sternum, the ribs, the pelvis, and the long bones. This is stimulated in part by low oxygen. So low oxygen will stimulate the kidneys to produce a hormone called EPO or erythropoietin. Does anybody recognize EPO? This is what Lance Armstrong got busted for, blood doping. So EPO is also sometimes abused to increase the number of red blood cells and increase your oxygen carrying capacity in your blood. So EPO stimulates blood cell production in the bone marrow. Um, this has to be done continuously, and it's done so at a rate of about 2 to 3 million cells per second. So here are the red blood cells, which are being produced in the bone marrow. The breakdown then will happen in the spleen. So here is the pathway that shows um, the stimulus for erythropoiesis, sort of a homeostatic, not sort of, this is a homeostatic pathway. So low oxygen will stimulate the kidneys to produce EPO. That will stimulate the bone marrow to increase red blood cells. The red blood cells then will be placed into the blood and that will increase the oxygen carrying capacity in the blood and relieve the low oxygen felt by the kidneys. Hemoglobin is a very important protein, and I want you guys to look at and memorize the structure of hemoglobin. It's important here, and it's also going to be important in our respiratory lectures. So heme and globin are, pro are groups that come together to make the hemoglobin. The globin portion is the protein portion. It has four subunits, which are diagrammed over here. One two alpha subunits, and then three and four, the beta subunits. So these large folded regions of the hemoglobin make up the four globin subunits. Then stuck inside each of the globin portions are these iron containing groups. This is the heme portion of hemoglobin. So the iron here is diagrammed with this bright red, and is the iron that specifically binds to the oxygen. It's diagrammed in red here because when iron is oxidized or when iron is bound to oxygen, it turns red. When the iron is deoxygenated, it will turn a more blue-purple color. 
Hemoglobin, though, can not only bind, doesn't only bind to oxygen, it also can bind in different portions of the hemoglobin molecule to carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, acid, and nitric oxide. So here is a zoom in of the hemoglobin molecule. Maybe take a moment to draw out the four subunits and put in the four heme groups and show where oxygen would bind. So the oxygen binds right here at the center of each heme group. So there is the heme group zoomed in with its iron at the center. So anemia is caused by low oxygen carrying capacity in the blood and there's many possible um, ways that anemia can come about. You can get anemia for having low iron, that's nutritional anemia. You can get anemia from having low red blood cells, that's because um, vitamin B12 is required for red blood cell production. So if you are low in vitamin B12, you can have pernicious anemia. You can have low red blood cell production due to some other issue with the red bone marrow, that's aplastic anemia. You can have low red blood cell production because of low EPO, that's renal anemia caused by a deficit in the kidney production of EPO. You could also have hemorrhagic anemia, that's due to excessive blood loss. So there's nothing wrong with the production or the presence of the blood, but you just lost a lot of blood. Then you can have hemolytic anemia, which is due to defective or damaged red blood cells. The most common causes of hemolytic anemia will be malaria and sickle cell disease. So normal red blood cells have a normal blood has a hematocrit of 45% red blood cells. Anemia will be 30% or lower. You can also have the opposite, polycythemia, or too many red blood cells, and that is if your hematocrit gets 70% or higher. This can be contrasted with a simple dehydration, um, which will be a lack of fluid, and that will be um, that will cause a high hematocrit as well, but it's because the plasma is low, not because, because the red blood cells are low. Okay, now to white blood cells. So white blood cells are also called leukocytes. They are less than 1% of the total blood volume, but they are extremely important for our internal defenses and the immune system. So the general functions of the white blood cells are to provide defense against foreign pathogens, foreign cells like bacteria, viruses, parasites, they can remove debris, and they can also destroy cancer cells. There are five types of white blood cells. Hopefully you remember these from anatomy, but we'll go through them very briefly. Neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. In anatomy, you should have gone through the type and appearance of the white blood cells. So there are a group of white blood cells that when you stain them, they appear granular. That is the neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. And there are a group of white blood cells that don't get grainy or lumpy looking. They look more smooth, and that is the monocytes and the lymphocytes. You can also tell the difference within groups by the shape and structure of the nucleus. So neutrophils have these very multi-lobed sort of blobby nuclei. Lymphocytes have a large circular nuclei that takes up the entire content of the cell such that a lymphocyte looks like a very dark purple cell. Monocytes have this kind of Pac-Man shape to their nucleus. Eosinophils have a trilobed or multilobed nucleus, and they also stain a sort of reddish color. Basophils have a more filled nucleus and stain very darkly. So let's look at the functions of the white blood cells, and we will return to this again when we do the immune system. So the white blood cells are often going to be um, getting rid of foreign invaders by either chopping them up 
um, eating them, destroying them. We call this eating of, of pathogens or taking them inside phagocytosis. So neutrophils are the primary um, cell in the body that can do this. So they will engulf and destroy the bacteria. So they will surround it and break it down. They can also surround and break down debris that is found. Lymphocytes are going to be important um, for our B cell and T cell type immunity. We're going to go through all of this when we do the immune system, but B cells can produce antibodies and T cells can help the B cells and also independently kill infected cells and cancerous cells. Monocytes are another group of phagocytes, so they can clean up debris and foreign material. Basophils are important for allergic responses, so they are very active in producing histamine. They also produce something called heparin, which helps to prevent clotting. Heparin is also important for fat removal, and you will see heparin used clinically as an anticoagulant or something that thins the blood to prevent the blood from clotting. Eosinophils are also important in allergic reactions, but they don't produce histamine. They will attach to, in addition, and kill parasites. So when we do um, blood counts, you can see the various um, numbers of white blood cells change based on the type of infection that you would have. So for example, if you had a parasitic infection, you would see a much higher number of eosinophils compared to normal and all the way going up. So white blood cells will be produced at varying rates depending on the body needs. For example, we would increase neutrophils with bacterial infection, we would increase eosinophils with parasitic infection, um, and there are chemicals that will be released from infected or damaged tissues to signal to the bone marrow to increase white blood cell production specifically. The last formed element is the platelets. So platelets are less than 1% of the total blood volume. They are technically not complete cells. They are technically fragments of cells that are produced from bone marrow cells. They're produced from these very, very large cells called megakaryocytes, and little chunks of megakaryocytes will break off to form platelets. But I think often platelets sort of get ignored. They actually kind of, they look like dust on the microscope when you're um, looking at blood smears. But they actually do have some interesting properties. They contain organelles. They also contain actin and myosin. So they actually can secrete and they actually have contractile capabilities. So they're not just little plugs. They can signal and they can release chemicals. Their lifespan is very short, about 10 days. Um, when they are broken down, they're broken down by the spleen and also by the liver. Their production will be increased by thrombopoietin, a hormone that is released by the liver to stimulate platelet production in the bone marrow. Their lifespan, again, 10 days. And here's how it happens. One megakaryocyte will break off about a thousand platelets from its cytoplasm. Its production will be increased by thrombopoietin, and they will be broken down by macrophages located in the spleen and the liver. There's a megakaryocyte, giant cells, and here are some little chunks of platelets about to break off. So here's a cluster of developing red blood cells, here's a cluster of developing white blood cells, and you can see these little chunks here are platelets being released. So as a summary of blood cell production, this all takes place from stem cells in the bone marrow. We have stem cells that can produce red blood cells, stem cells that can produce white blood cells, and stem cells that can produce platelets. The myeloid stem cells produce the megakaryocytes, granular white blood cells, and monocytes. The lymphoid stem cells specifically produce the B and T cells, or the lymphocytes, in the immune system. The CBC, or the complete blood count, is done to compare the normal levels 
or expected levels of white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets to any conditions that your patient might have. So these are typical values that you would see in a patient. And if you see any abnormalities, you can trace it back to their function. So as I said, for example, eosinophils are only about 1% to 4% of the complete blood cell count. If you see a huge increase in eosinophils, then that could indicate that your patient is having um, a parasitic infection and you would treat them appropriately. Okay. Hemostasis is the cascade of steps that stops bleeding and forms a clot in a broken blood vessel. This is a natural response to injury. So it has three steps, vascular spasm, platelet aggregation, and clot formation. So first, you have a break in a blood vessel. This damage to the blood vessel will automatically constrict the blood vessel. This is likely due to paracrine signals that are released from the damaged endothelial cells. So it's going to tighten up the broken blood vessel. The second is platelet aggregation. Now this is because you're going to have um, something called von Willebrand factor, VWF. This is a protein that will stick platelets to the collagen. So here's your damaged blood vessel. This is the exposed collagen from the damage, and the VWF will be secreted. VWF will cause the platelets to stick to the injury site, and it will form a plug. The platelets will be activated and develop these spiny processes that cause them to stick together even more. The injury site will also secrete ADP and thromboxane A2, which will further increase platelet aggregation. Platelets will continue to respond to these signals, continuing to increase the number of platelets and continuing to increase the secretion of these signals as we continue to plug the injury. What does this sound like? I know, I'm asking a totally leading question. It's positive feedback. We had a signal that caused an increase, and then that signal increased in, in um, strength because of the platelets that came in. More signal was then secreted. More platelets came in, more and more and more, until the injury site is plugged. The platelets will then contract to tighten up the plug, and they will release vasoconstrictors to help to close off that broken vessel. The last step is clot formation. So clot formation is not the platelet plug. Clot formation is in addition to the platelet plug. So the blood in the vicinity of the injury is going to become more solid due to a protein that is excreted. So it's going to um, accumulate fibrinogen. This protein will convert to fibrin and form a mesh at the injury site. There's a lot of fibrin circulating in the bloodstream and it will accumulate at the injury site. This will require activation of a molecule called thrombin and it will be balanced by a molecule called TPA, tissue plasminogen activator. TPA can remove clots if they form in undesirable places. Clotting cascade, then, is that the clotting proteins cannot be present normally in the blood. It's very dangerous if you have a high number of clotting factors in the blood because you start forming abnormal clots and you can plug blood vessels and cause um, you know, pulmonary embolism, heart attack, stroke, etc. So these are only activated upon need. So we need to make sure that this clotting cascade is only activated when it's really necessary. So this cascade then is complex and it causes it's it is caused by a molecular cascade of 12 plasma clotting factors. Ultimately though the bottom line is that fibrinogen is going to be converted to fibrin. So it basically looks like this. 
you have platelet aggregation that is going to secrete platelet factor 3. Other factors in the clotting cascade will increase prothrombin. Prothrombin then will be activated to thrombin. Thrombin is the final stimulus that will cause the conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin. That mesh work is going to be stabilized into the final clot. That all happened because of the initial platelet aggregation. Now thrombin also enhances platelet aggregation. So thrombin can increase the aggregation of platelets to increase the factors which will ultimately increase the clot. But the platelet aggregate is not the same as the clot. The clot comes later. This is a picture of the clotting cascade. I am not going to test you guys on the clotting cascade. So you can make a note here on this slide. This will not be on the exam, I promise. <laughs> but it may come up later, so I want you guys to have seen it once. Okay? There are many factors down the cascade which ultimately lead to clot formation. So let's work our way backwards. The clot is formed by fibrin. That I want you to know. Fibrin forms the stabilized, network, stabilized meshwork that creates the clot. That is triggered by thrombin. Thrombin converts fibrinogen to fibrin. Now where the cascade gets complex is how thrombin was created. So there are several factors upstream of thrombin that have to be activated in order for thrombin to be activated. So these have numbers like um, factor 7, factor 6, factor 4, factor 5. No, I don't want you guys to memorize these, but I do want you to know that ultimately they activate thrombin, which activates fibrin, and makes the clot. And there are two basic ways to do that. You can have internal jam damage, for example, damage to the internal vessel surface, exposed collagen, that can lead to this cascade of factors to activate thrombin. Or you can have external damage or tissue damage that can lead to this factor, factor 3, and ultimately combine here to activate thrombin. That's an extrinsic pathway. In the end, you will form a fibrin mesh that is the clot. There are many clotting disorders. Um, the most um, which will come up for you clinically is a thromboembolism. So this is a moving clot. So if a clot forms in an intact vessel due to some damage, prior damage, then it dislodges. If it dislodges, it can go into other vessels, particularly smaller vessels, and cause strokes, heart attacks, pulmonary embolism that happens in the lungs, deep vein thrombosis or a blood clot in the leg, etc. This can occur to an imbalance in the clotting mechanism. Sometimes it's genetic. You have genetic conditions which make you more likely to have blood clotting. Sometimes it's because of slow moving blood. And sometimes it's because of increased release of thromboplastin from excessively damaged tissue. There are other clotting disorders that um, occur. Hemophilia is the opposite. Hemophilia is a deficiency in clotting, and this can cause excessive bleeding. So a small injury that would normally be taken care of by the clotting system is not able to be plugged, and hemophiliacs are at risk of bleeding due to very um, uh, small conditions. Thrombocytopenia, then, is a deficiency in platelets, and that can be um, caused by an impaired liver or lack of vitamin K, which are involved in the platelet production pathway. Okay, I told you this one was going to be short. Uh, make sure that you know each of the components and the basics here, and you guys will be good to go. That's going to end our cardiovascular unit, and we will pick up 
um, in a bit. So let me know if you have questions.